All right, and speaking of presentations, um, I would like to introduce you to uh, this, uh, the first speak, uh, first presentation of this block at PyCon 2019, Shu uh, Hong Wong, and speaking about releasing the world's largest Python site every seven minutes. Please make him feel welcome. Hi. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Shu Hong, and my talk is about continuous deployment and how we do it at Instagram. So, something about me first. Um, who am I? I'm a father of three lovely kids. I work on Instagram since 2014 to about four and a half years now. I'm a production engineer turned manager. So, um, the state of server release right now. In Instagram, we release server code 70 to 100 times daily. Um, this is about seven minutes at, every seven minutes at peak. So at Instagram, we operate a very large fleet of web servers serving Instagram.com. And every weekday, uh, we deploy new code. So during peak deployment hours, it can be as fast as every seven minutes. In this talk, I will walk through the series of evolution that brought Instagram here, sharing the insights we learned and the problems we had. Everyone can identify with at least a stage of this continuous evolution. And I hope that this can either be an inspiration or a blueprint for your continuous deployment system. Just like every one of you, we started with a deploy script. A deploy script that copies a package, unpack it on the host, change the symlink, and reload the server. We made this script accessible to all engineers and encourage anyone to deploy the site and take down the site themselves. So to make it accessible, so that any engineer can deploy it at any time, we had a simple locking mechanism so that we, can, we don't have more than one person deploying it at a time. We have very good test coverage from day one, so we hook up the script to run our test suite before deploying. However, tests can have its blind size, so we then build a simple canary process that deploys the code to a few machines and monitor the written HTTP status code. So you can see in this simplified table, we compare a 200 HTTP status code return for the dinosaur view, and since the change is small, it's task safe to deploy. As we have more engineers and become harder to track what commits were being deployed, we built a system to track deployments. This gave us better visibility, and we are able to correlate what changed when we saw errors in production. Then we also want to notify the authors so that they can be around to support their changes. The commit author is usually the best person to figure out if an error we see in production is related to that change. Eventually, we also needed to upgrade our parallelism engine, as one machine couldn't handle deployment just quite fast enough. So we have a tier of machines that allow us to do a parallel SSH, SSH execution. So what I'm trying to say over here is that we have a deployment script, and it matured over time. There are a lot of features. We kept on building it. It has been deploying Instagram for many, many years. Uh, it also laid the foundation on how we do deployment in Instagram. This is a simple yet very significant phase of our deployment journey. Much of our deployment process was conceived and codified during this time when it was easy and fast to prototype and improvement. Implement running our tests can be done in a day, canary can be done in a week. Automation doesn't need to be complex. So also improvement to the script also came organically. When anyone can deploy code, actually encourage the commit authors to own the process. So when Instagram engineering team was small, Many people actually commit, contributed code to the deployment script. A lot of ideas that went to the deployment script came from the people that used the script. So human is also the weak link. So we wanted, we wanted to empower engineers to deploy their own code. However, you can push code, or you can deploy code. doesn't mean that you will deploy code. So I can land code on Friday night and promise that to deploy on Monday morning. But Saturday came, we need to deploy a hotfix. And my broken code that I landed in trunk just went out together with the hotfix and caused a lot of confusion where the additional breakage came from. So um, there are also escape doors and options in the script. When put in the hands of humans, sometimes inconsistent, I can say that, well, I know I broke this test, but it's just the test. We can, we can still deploy, and I'll fix it in a later commit. So um, the deployment script empowered humans to take control and ownership. We also found that humans were not the most trustworthy lot. So, um, for example, do you want to run tests before pushing? Yes, of course. Test failed, do you want to continue pushing? No. <laughs> so, um, at the same time, we noticed that all the options in the deployment script can have safe defaults. 
most of the time, people should just use the automatic safe defaults. Lesson learned is that do not pre present them with options to override. So override only became explicit and only when we needed to take calculated risk to fix an urgent problem. So what happens when you have safe defaults? So if, you manage to take, if the script manages to take a log, manage to run tests successfully, canary successfully, deploy successfully, it can just go to the next one. So when all the, when all the stars are aligned, we don't need any human input. So, so we, it came after a while, we think about it. Um, we have a commit. As the safety force in the deployment script continue to mature, we, re we realize that we can probably hook it up to the post commit hook so that uh, it runs the deployment script with the auto defaults. And this is the start of our continuous deployment journey. Starting with the script, polishing it, putting in the automation brass to the point where we can do continuous deployment. And maybe you have all the ingredients that, that you need, and it's already primed to do your own continuous deployment. So what do we get at this stage? The computer is doing deployment for us. We deploy every single commit consistently and as soon as it lands. It reduces time taken to narrow down an error to a change we know as soon as the build breaks. Continuous deployment also became a service. So we noticed a shift in paradigm. Continuous deployment, like it or not, became a service that's owned by the deployment team. The whole intent of setting up the post commit hook is to remove the human, and we were successful. The paradigm shifted from, I am going to deploy this myself, to I'm going to land this and let automation take over. There are a few side effects to this. So fewer people actually know how it works, how to deploy the site, and how to roll back. As we scale and we have more and more engineers committing code, we have more instances of the build breaking because people accidentally commit broken code. So this is not scalable. The deployment team became the bottleneck. So we came up with an idea. Why not just, just don't break trunk? Uh, so trunk was often broken because engineers unwittingly land broken code. Can we stop them from doing so? When build is broken, it's almost always extra effort to resolve because the people who notice the breakage are not the people who, who not, are not the best people to understand the breakage. When a post commit doesn't pass, it doesn't deploy. It runs block and slow down. So we build a land blocking flow. As soon as an engineer tries to land a diff, it's rebased on the master, run test, run canary. And many of these instances can happen in parallel. Epic, dozens of changes can be in flight at the same time. And we only allow a, a change to land on the master when it passes test and canary. The, so the commits are stacked on the master branch. We only use the master branch. We know the last deploy marker. As soon as commits are landed, we run test and canary on them again. The reason why we run test and canary again on them is because commits can raise when they land. Two independently passing commits can conflict and fail post commit. So test and canary run at their own speed. Sometimes a diff that landed later might finish testing earlier. When we have a commit that passed test, we immediately deploy to that commit. And this goes on and on. So what does this land blocking flow give us? So we ensure that commit is production worthy before allowing the land. So we push back the ownership back to the commit author to own the change. This is very effective because they are the best people to understand what went wrong when tests fail. So the, and this also localizes the impact of breaking the build to the engineer himself also putting back the responsibility back to the hands of the engineer. So everyone moves faster when they are not blocked. And this reduces the load on release engineering. And it actually reduces release engineering as the bottleneck. So lesser, lesser incidence of trunk broken means that commits are now deployed more reliably. Commits will be pushed to production within one hour of the commit landing. Um, because of the land blocking flow, we have a higher guarantee that the commits that landed will be deployable. So now we could establish an SLA of deploying commit within one hour of it landing. The real upside is that now we can put forth the expectation for the engineer to be online to support their changes when, it, when they are deployed. There's no risk that um, when, it, when we deploy a change, we realize the engineer has already left the company. So another important control flow is the land lock. Sometimes we need to pause the pipeline. So production is in trouble, we need to roll back or do manual investigation we usually take a deploy log so that, well, we don't deploy anything right now. We also have a land log where we can take to stop anyone from committing code. It happens sometimes. We have to take all the logs, um, manually understand and resolve the situation before resuming the pipeline again. 
this allows us not to um, power out commits waiting to deploy. We typically do not accumulate more than tens of commits waiting to deploy. So what really happens when an error slips past test and canary? We take all the logs and do manual firefight. So Instagram, so what's worth pointing out is that Instagram has a culture around building tests. We always ask in post-mortem, why wasn't the error caught by test or canary? This culture actually is a backbone and reinforces continuous deployment. Of course, test and canary are not bulletproof. Sometimes you need volume to overload a backend. Some of the slow firing errors only become obvious at scale. Test coverage is good, but humans do make mistakes. So to catch errors that are only, only obvious at scale, we're set up to improve it, the deployment system that can do deployment in phases. So Canary used to be our last line of defense. We go through div, testing, Canary, then deploy to everything. Um, we added the C1 tier. So the C1 tier is um, the first tier we deploy to is about 2% of all hosts. So the div now goes from div, testing, Canary. We let it sit in C1 for five minutes, and if we don't see an increase in errors in C1s, then we deploy to everything. So for a single commit, the time taken to reach all production increased by the time you need to sit in C1. So test, canary, type check, typically takes about 10 minutes. C1, 7, C2, 7. So at this point in time, you're thinking, hey, how is this deploying every seven minutes? So, um, so if you are the first commit of the day, the first deployment takes about 24 minutes from the time the commit landed until it's pushed the entire production. Remember that test, canary, and type checks, they run in parallel. So as soon as like, if you have six, 10 divs that land, they'll all run in parallel at the same time. Then we have a list of um, ready commits to deploy. So C1, with a queue of tested commits, the throughput of the system actually depends on how fast we can move commits through C1 and C2 because they are pipeline. As soon as something passed test, it will move to C1. C1 passed, it move to the next, next commit. So C1 and C2 moves every seven minutes. So at this point in time, our deploy script gets way too complex. Like, there's massive coordination needed to do uh, deployment in phases. Script was just doing too many things. It was, it, was an, it was a nightmare. So we finally threw out many thousand lines of deployment script. But note that we came a really long way. We used our deployment script for a really long time. So we still have the post commit hook. What it does is that it, push, it pushes commit info into a database. Um, we built a controller. There is, a, as a decision maker, the move deployments along. So the controller queries the DB for a list of commits, understand what is last deployed, what is ready to be deployed, and makes a decision to promote a version to a tier of machines. Then we have, we have two runners. So the runners are responsible for the tier that they, uh, they belong to. So the runner pulls the version for the tier from the database and, through a, um, and broadcasts the instruction to row to all the machines. And within those machines, we have a deployment agent that uh, implements the row and the log interface. Uh, so log simply means that I'm going to, uh, the machine itself knows how to pull a package, load a new code, reload itself, and yep, be done with it. Log just means that we do not move the version until the end of TTR. So we can log a machine and say that please do not continuous deploy on. So in this system, solve a few uh, problems for us. We were able to codify a state system that we can deploy in phases. And it, it actually decomposed the complex system that was a script into simpler components that is a controller, a runner, and a, a various agents that we can reason, debug, and improve iteratively. So we have now a pipeline deployment system that's deploying once every seven minutes. C1 became our second lines of defense for the site. And the system is modular. So, but it is still a fact that a single commit takes now takes longer to deploy to production. The line became longer by the time taken to sit at C1 and C2. And how fast C1 and C2 can progress depends on how fast we can reload code. Next, so we try to, depl de we try to deploy as fast as we can. But really, we want to answer well, why do we want it fast. So you see the comment on the right very often. We definitely care about iteration speed, but it's actually more than that. Being able to deploy fast means that we get better support from the, code, the commit authors when the code was being rolled out. So this means we can react faster to breakages. And our engineers, they don't slow down for us. The longer it takes to deploy means that 
more commits are batched at once. This makes deploying even more dangerous. So this just like deploying faster just better means better productivity and safety for us. So we so when there's only one commit in queue, we just obviously deploy the single commit. So when there are two commits in queue, so we know that the time taken to deploy the first commit is 24 minutes. Pipeline deploy means that the next one takes seven more minutes after the first. Still deploy commits one by one because we have time to deploy both in an hour. But what if we have 20 commits in a queue? So theoretically, we can deploy about eight times an hour. So we need to deploy three at once to go through 20, 20 of them in, a, in one hour. So it's just a balance between batching as little as we can and still deploying within one hour of commit landing. So we can all only deploy at the speed of allowed capacity loss. Ideally, we want to widen that rate band over there so that we deploy um, to many machines at once and be done with deployment as soon as possible. But that also means that um, we, we we need to have um, machines sitting idly around waiting for us to, to deploy, and that's a waste of capacity. So how do we go about making sure that we are reloading as fast as we can by using as less as little capacity to reload as we can? So we use UEG. We build a hop swap mechanism to reload code without draining the server. So the idea is that we fork and re a new master we shut down the idle worker that we find as idling between requests. We spawn a new worker on a new master. Um, eventually moving all workers to the new master. And then shut down master with the old code. And the server reload is done. So throughout this time, the server is continuously taking traffic. Yeah, the servers are continuously taking traffic during this time. So what this gives us is that it exploits all the minute idle time that we have when the server is, is sitting waiting between requests to reload the, first, the code as fast as possible. So during low load time, low traffic, the servers reload faster. During high load, servers reload slower. But they, the message here is that we can't limit the volume of commits that, uh, that engineers throw at us. In fact, we kind of exist to enable uh, the development productivity. So how fast we can deploy really affects how many deployments we can do in one hour and how many commits we need to batch per deployment. Deploying faster, smaller batches of commit equals to easier to find out if something broke. As we grew, we increasingly met problems such as needing to run slightly different versions of server runtime, scaling parallelism for our runners. Our fleet used to be 100% homogeneous, but it wasn't always so. Sometimes there was once we did a Py2 to Py3 migration, we need to run different Python runtime for, dif for different parts of the fleet. C1, C2 is now a permanent feature, they move at different times. Maybe we do a runtime upgrade and we need to leave it for a few days. Another team needs to test a new version of a library in the virtual M. And the point is that we need different configuration at parts of the fleet. And throughout history, we use various hacky methods to make that happen. Sometimes putting a file into the machine, teaching our pieces of tools to, uh, to understand that. So we think like, so we came up with the thought, what if indiv each individual server knows exactly what code is supposed to run and does its own deployment? So when we need to run different configuration in, in production, the runners quickly becomes unwieldy. Like, we need a different runner for each of the different configuration we run. And to scale to more machine, we need to shard them. So we remove the runners. And we have each service agent read its own tier mapping to understand what version it needs to be at. So this is so on a server, on a single server, the server reads the tiers assigned package. It fetches a package itself, it promotes itself, it reloads, and this repeats again. So with this, we do, we do not need to worry or rework the system when we need to add more machines to the fleet. So over the years, we solved one problem after another and ended up with this system here that's deploying 70 to 100 times a day and every seven minutes a pick. So the landing strip enforces the land blocking flow. It's our first line of defense. It's a, it's a parallel workflow. An engineer should only block him or herself 
Without signal from the landing strip, we would never be able to operate our continuous deployment system. The controller does what a very disciplined human would do with 100% consistency. This is the part that moves the side every seven minutes. Then each machine in the fleet is then responsible for itself and deploys as fast as possible through hot reloading code. This is the grand overview of the system. However, in this presentation, I want to point out that it is not the system or that we deploy 70 to 100 times a day, or we do that seven, every seven minutes that's interesting. I feel that the cool parts are the problem and we, that we had and the North Stars that guided us to build this deployment system. In Instagram, we always say, do the simple things first. So it is true that we never had a grand plan of what continuous deployment and Instagram will be like. We did what is enough for us to scale. When the step was mundane and repetitive, we let the computer take over. When lens were breaking trunk, we made it compulsory to pass all tests and canary before landing. When we discovered that one single big push was breaking production, we broke it up in phases and we still run the controller on a cron job. So next thing, like pushing as fast as we can. This is a rather simple yet important concept that um, regular pushes make production changes these things. Remember the XKCD comic? That's what we tell people that we care about their experience and deploying faster. But really deploying faster allows us to deploy in smaller batches. And it turns out to be safer for production too. So this also means that when we push more frequently, it, the, easier it, the, more, the, the more we do this, the easier it gets. We are definitely bolder when we know that each deployment change is small. And this is, a, this is the last slide, and the most important one. There is, there is no continuous deployment without signal um, if the change that we are about to make is going to break production. And the truth is that my team will never be able to build such a system without a culture around code quality and testing that is held to a very high standard by the engineers in Instagram. It is the, the hard work by the larger Instagram infra team to push type checking to 100% in our behemoth code base, the push for comprehensive test coverage, relentlessly asking why wasn't this caught in tests, the server-side frameworks that made building new features safe that made all of this possible. So, and some of the amazing people from Instagram that are carrying this culture are sitting amongst you right now. So go grab them at Instagram booth at the exhibi exhibition. Talk to them to learn more about engineering at Instagram. So, in short, the last slide is just saying about you can't do continuous deployment without signal. With that, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Thank you very much, Xu Hong. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions if there are any people who would like to ask them. There are microphones in the aisles. Please uh, step up if you have a question. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, one thing that I'm wondering is you seem to kind of rely on the fact that every possible program that could be introduced by a commit actually shows up within these, well, seven minutes or 24 minutes. Um, is that really true? I would expect there is often problems that only show up like maybe after six hours or so, and if you've deployed another 10 times since then, can you really easily attribute this back? Okay, so six hours is too long. So usually at, at Instagram's rate of scale and like traffic, the, you know it the minute it hits production. So to come back to that question, um, I would say about, I would say that the, the pre-landing flow is just about uh, running tests and make sure that well, you, the, the things that the engineer put in is not complete garbage. The canary is the one that, uh, that saves the site a lot of times. Typically, we catch one or two bad commits a day. And the C1 is like the extended coverage that we say that, well, if, if production looks right, then there is a small amount of things that actually slips through. And this is the part that, that keeps the team awake at night, right? Like to keep reiterating on that, taking a look at, oh, how did this actually get to production? And those small bits of things. So it's, sometimes it's about increasing uh, canary coverage, like um, increasing the number of machines that we run canary on so that we get better signals. Sometimes it's about whether if we ever if we actually surface that signal at all through uh, logging, through um, 
logging of metrics in uh, to our logging system. So I feel that I go went about answering your question. So in short, the usually if something is obvious in production, you, it, it's really obvious in the first minute. And if it's um, if we miss it in the pipeline, we iterate on it and find ways to improve it. Hi. Um, <clears throat> did you ever think of uh, doing like a more traditional alpha, beta production staging? No. Um, I, I thought about that, but you see, like the, the, the best, I, I, I keep saying that there's, you can't do continuous, continuous deployment without signal. The best signal comes from actually the real code hitting production. That is, I mean, it's not, this is not to say that test in production, but like the, the slower when it, when it hits the, the, every user, the, the, um, the slower that we get that signal back to, to iterate. I've, I wouldn't completely reject that thought, but it's just that we care a lot about development speed as well, and this, this model works very well for us right now. How many different services is this deploy pipeline interacting with? Are you pushing multiple services at the same time, or is this infrastructure running for, one, for each individual service? This is a monolith. So Instagram.com runs on a monolith right now. And um, this, this system over here pushed the main Instagram.com site. And there are also other microservices that we have, but they have their own push cycles. Yeah, I'm interested to know uh, how much your engineers rely on the deploy time tests and the canary versus tests they run themselves before they make the commit in the first place to know the quality, their, like the signal, if their, their code is good or not. Uh, so I have no data point on this, actually. I, I have this hunch that people usually put their change through the system and, and test if the system catches that, the, the error for them. Hi, I've got a, two questions actually. Uh, first one, do Instagram engineers also use feature flagging and how does that fit into the deployment system? Sorry, can you repeat your question again? Do you use feature flagging and how does that fit into your deployments? Feature flags, yes, uh, we do use that. So it is not factored into this at all. So we want to expand our um, Canary system to also cover that surface. Okay. And hello. Uh, one more question. How do you deploy your deployment system? How do we deploy our deployment system? Oh, that's great. Like, that's a really good question. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, we deploy our deployment system continuously as well. It breaks, but uh, we also like to know as soon as it breaks. And usually when a deployment system breaks, it is it's always under control, and it was, we can always uh, roll it back really fast. So it's more about uh, maybe a, a 10, 20 minutes outage of the deployment system, and we quickly bring it back online, turn ourselves in the back, and move on. <laughs> uh, last question here. Uh, I'm Hello? Okay. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about how the UWSGI removal master process fix up uh, works, or is that like a trade secret? Or? Yes, so uh, one of my ex-colleagues uh, gave a talk uh, at PyCon Australia. Um, so for more details, watch that talk. Yeah, um, but feel free to look for me up, uh, look at me up at, at the Instagram booth, we can explain to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you again, Shu Hong. Thank you.